What we're going to look at now is the aggregates that we use in construction, not just for uh, lime mortars or lime plasters, but in all construction. And it's almost the forgotten part of, and I'll use the term mortar to apply to plasters as well, because it's simpler. But people tend to forget how important the aggregate is. And it always makes up anything between 20, 5, 30, 50, 80% of your mix. So it does a job. And I think what's quite often missed is that the aggregate does the work. The binder, which sticks it together, is literally that. It is literally just a binder to glue those pieces of aggregate together. So aggregates, we can call them sands as well, are predominantly uh, river gravels, crushed rock. They can be um, sourced from the sea dredged aggregate or from pit dredged or scalpings from a rock face as well. They've all got different properties, but it is not a filler. It is what does the work. And our binder, which in construction would either be ordinary Portland cement, lime, gypsum, clay, asphalt or uh, mastic, bitumen as mastic, which is what holds it together. Its job is just to hold the aggregates together. Now we've got such a variety of aggregates already that I've described, but they also have their own individual properties. If you had aggregate that was, whether it was a river gravel or if it was crushed rock and it was granite, it's actually going to be harder, denser, less permeable than a soft sandstone or a chalk. I think we can all accept that straight away. So when we're actually making a mortar, it's not just the strength of the binder and what the binder's doing, it's the strength of the aggregate. So within that, about, apart from having different types of stone, different rock that make up our aggregate, we've got the different sizes and what it looks like. When we actually make a, whether it's a mortar, a plaster, or even if you're looking at a concrete or a limecrete, we wouldn't just make them using cement. It wouldn't work. We need to have the actual bulk of that material as an aggregate. And I want to demonstrate just in a quick sketch how that aggregate works, how it sticks together and why we have to have a matrix. We have to have a variety of size particles to hold it together. And this also has an influence on how much binder, how much lime or Portland cement we use. So just going to have a little sketch up of some aggregates. Now I'm taking this to be a representation. So what I'm going to draw are pieces of aggregate this sort of size, 20, 25 mil roughly, but enlarged for this demonstration. So just a selection of pieces of aggregate which are all of pretty much the same size. Now if we were going to make a mix of some sort of mortar out of those, let's say about 20-25 mil in size, we need to stick it together. So the binder, its job is to stick each of those particles together. And how that does that, it coats each of those pieces of aggregate in a thin layer of glue but it's only going to glue where they touch it's only going to fix them together where it touches the binder lime specifically in our case its job is not to fill the gap its job is to just stick those pieces of aggregate together so let's put some glue on there 
So as I've said, we're just sticking the pieces together where they touch. But you can see there are gaps. Now those gaps, when we make a mix, they could be full of water or they could be full of the binder. But the binder is weak. So actually filling those gaps with binder doesn't actually help. What we need to have is a smaller piece of stone. So we've come down quite a size in our pieces of aggregate to fill those gaps. And we can put some more binder, some more glue around those. And what you can see has happened is immediately we're getting more surface contact. They're gluing together better. But there are still gaps. So we'll take some smaller aggregate. We could do this in several more stages, coating each of those smaller particles in more lime, more binder. We're getting more surface area, so we're actually getting a stronger mix. What we're also doing is by filling those gaps, we're making it stronger without the binder. The actual aggregate filling all those voids is naturally stronger already. This blend of having fine particles, almost from dust, right up to, could be 20, 25 millimetres if we were looking at a, a lime creep. That blend fills all these gaps, that matrix. And I'm going to do some sieving in a minute. And if I do that, you will see that we get, hopefully, a nice blend. And if you were to draw it on a graph, it's that perfect bell jar shape. The majority of the, the volume is in the middle area, a few large particles and a few fine particles. And that's what we have to have in our aggregate matrix. And this doesn't make any difference if you're looking at cement mortars or lime mortars. It's the same rule of thumb. What you may have also noticed is I've not drawn these as round pieces of aggregate. I've drawn them angular. And that's because by having an angular aggregate, they lock together. They actually form some strength. Not necessarily crushable strength, that could come from the type of stone, but the actual strength of them locking in a matrix will actually give more strength to that mortar or plaster. And that's a very simple demonstration. I've got this is just crushed limestone, uh, it's actually uh, gravel for a parking area and 20 25 mil it hasn't got a good matrix there's no finer particles but they're all crushed so they're angular it forms a pile if i put some weight on it it resists so this could be a point loading construction it is resisting that if i get some rounded aggregate some marbles, I'm not going to put them on the table because they'll just roll off. You cannot make a stack. Anybody that's been in one of those play parks will know that you walk on those plastic balls and you sink, you go Bricklayers love to have this type of aggregate because it flows, it's quick, it's easy to work with. But as a binder, in a mortar or a plaster, it's inferior. If our binder was cement, ordinary Portland cement, it does have some inherent strength. 
So it would lock those ball bearing type pieces of aggregate together. Lime, it's a weaker material, especially a pure lime, but the aggregate is doing the work. And it is vitally important that you have this blend of angular aggregates. What I'm gonna do now is, it's a field test, um, it's a sieve analysis. You can buy British standard sieves for regular sizes for measuring aggregates. And straight away I'll say the ones we've got here, these are actually British standard sieves which are meant for soils, soil samples, not for uh, aggregates for construction. Um, and that's simply based on the fact that these are cheaper. However, they will do the same job. They will give us an idea of the blend of aggregates if you were to just buy or source standard aggregates. They're graded. You can see the numbers on them. Um, fine, obviously, going down to quite coarse. So what we've got here is some samples of construction aggregates, all taken from sites or from builders merchants. Um, I have one which I picked up literally this morning and just by feeling it the good part is and have to reinforce this it's dry so that we can actually sieve it we can't sieve a wet aggregate it won't go through the gaps so this is a dry builder's sand just looking at it and feeling it in my hands it doesn't stay together very well. It doesn't actually hold. And it's very sandy. It's very fine particles. There are a few larger particles within it, but not many. And we will do a little sieve analysis of this in a minute. Alternatively, this is uh, an aggregate which we use. No organic material because organic material will decay. And it's quite a coarse, you straight away hold it. It keeps some of its form. And that's because it's angular and it's got larger particles. They're actually not that angular. This I think is from uh, pit sand. So hopefully this will actually produce quite a nice blend when we sieve it. I've got lots of samples, things I've picked up from uh, St. Asaf, a fine red sand, so that will be for a finishing product. Um, from Dolgetli, quite a coarseish aggregate. And this one's interesting because if you smell it, it smells earthy. It's actually got clay in it, which may make a difference to the mortars that you make out of that. So we'll sieve some of this. Uh, sand which I say I picked up this morning it's nice and dry we don't need much and we'll just drop some into the sieve obviously larger sieve size first now what we would like is our larger aggregates to be appropriate to what we're going to use the mortar for I'll explain that later on but uh, nothing there that size. So we're looking at two and a half to three millimeters there. We're getting smaller, we're getting finer. Now that is as I suspected. We have a few larger particles and we do have a blend, but they're all in this middle section. There's not enough of the medium size and there's too few of the finer sizes. So that will not make a particularly good mortar. 
Now, if you were using sand and cement, that as your sand, you would get away with. But with lime, that is not a good blend. It's not filling the gaps all the way up to the larger particle. Now, when we actually talk about the larger particle sizes, there's a bit of a rule of thumb that we would like these sizes or an amount of them to be roughly a third, maybe even up to a half of the thickness of our plaster or mortar. So if we were bedding bricks with a 10 millimeter gap, you would want some three and four mil aggregate. And all of our modern technology and our modern construction would say that's too coarse. But this is because the lime itself is not as strong as the Portland cement. So the aggregate does the work. The aggregate keeps those bricks apart. So we need a coarsish aggregate. And the other reason we need to have larger pieces is stone doesn't shrink. The mortar shrinks with the water leaving. So it's the water that's made it plastic, that makes it workable. That mortar leaving, evaporating, is what causes the shrinkage. Quite obviously there's a volume of water in every mix we use. So when that water leaves, it leaves gaps which will cause shrinkage and cracking. The more blend you have, the less void, so the less water, but also the thickness of your mortar will create some shrinkage. So you need to have these bigger particles in there. Let's look at this coarse aggregate we just looked at a little bit earlier. It's one we use quite a lot for uh, backing plasters. Probably too coarse to lay bricks, but it might be a really nice uh, aggregate to use for laying stones. And as I've already said, you can quite clearly see some larger particles, but let's see what this does in the sieves. So we've already got some pieces of aggregate that are probably five or six millimetres. Yeah, probably five. That means that we can do a thickness of mortar with this of maybe even 15 millimetres thick and it will not have too much shrinkage in it. So this isn't very scientific, but it is actually all the information you need. And we do have some very, very fine dust, but not much. Instantly you can see that that is a better blend. You've got this bell jar, this curve of the majority of the aggregate in this middle size. Then we come down to finer and coarser, down to very coarse and very fine. If you were to put that together in a jar and look through it with a, a light, there would be very little voids. So that is a really nice blend. What you can't do is to say, well, if I want to use this for a thinner plaster, thinner mortar, we'll just exclude those. Because instantly now you've not got the blend. So blending the aggregate, sometimes this is natural in as it's dredged, as it's sourced, or it's actually sieved together and mixed. But we cannot emphasize enough how important that is of having the right aggregate, the right shapes of aggregate, the right sizes of aggregate and the blend of the aggregate. There are a couple of additional uh, field tests, site tests we can do 
with our aggregates other than sieving. I, I could sieve lots of these, but I think the picture tells its own story. But a couple of other things that we can do, and one of them is we can measure how wet a sand is. Because if we were actually writing a, a recipe, we might want to include how much water or how much binder we're putting in as a paste into that mix. And I said it, if we just took the larger aggregate, there's a lot of voids in there. And as I've already said, we don't want to fill them with a binder. But if we had a reasonably well-graded, well-blended aggregate, we want to coat every single one of those particles with some binder. How much binder we need really does get affected by those aggregate sizes. Again, just compare and contrast. If we had something this big, this sort of size, surface area, you wouldn't need much binder to stick those together. Whereas with this, to cover every single particle, you'd need a lot more binder. So the finer your aggregate, the more binder you need. The coarser your aggregate, the less binder you need. But if we have a decent blend, there is a way that we can work out how much of that binder in a wet form we would need. So to measure this quantity of binder in its wet form that we need, we need to start off with a dry sand. And I have got, we do everything by volume, remember, We've got 200 millilitres of dry, coarse aggregate. It's the same as this one. Try not to lose it all on the table. And it has a dry set volume. Got 800 millilitres of water. Might want to give this a little stir. You can see the bubbles, you can see the air coming out. And you can see that there's just enough moisture to reach saturation. It's just started to sit on top. The sand will always sink because it's in liquid. And there's a fraction too much water in there. But I can say that it went from 75 millilitres. So as a ratio, we can say how much water or binder in its liquid form would be needed to glue that aggregate together. On site, we don't do this. On site, we tend to do it as put in as much water as we need, hopefully not too much, until it's workable. But that is an optimum amount of binder for that aggregate. So we could do it as a percentage, or we could do it by volume, specifically. If we add more, what happens is, in this matrix, the actual binder starts to force the aggregates apart. And this is where we can say that putting too much binder will weaken a mix. And this doesn't matter if it's lime or Portland cement. If you put more than that optimum amount in, you weaken that structure. You've got a weaker mix. Same as if you put less in as well. So that's how we can just do a field test to work out the actual volume of liquid binder that we would need for that. The other thing we need to do because, or don't need to, but it's a good idea to do, and if we were batching large volumes, we would do this. And that is, if our aggregate, our sand is kept outside or is getting wet, sand bulks. As it gets wet, it actually increases in volume. I've literally 
just picked up some uh, damp building sand. It's very similar to this, so it's not particularly well graded. But it's a damp sand. So that sand is sticking together because it's wet. Not because it's actually got good cohesive qualities, it's not angular, it's because it's wet, because it's damp. Now, I'm not going to do this by volume, but what we can do is we want to measure what would the volume of this sand be if it was dry? As I said, we're mixing by volume all the time. So if we just give this a little bit of a shake, a little bit of a tamp to get most of the air out, that aggregate, that sand, has bulked in volume because it's damp. Now, if I take my marker pen, so we've marked the actual level, the volume, we could have actually done a set volume by measuring it and put it in, but we've literally just put some damp sand in there. We know that it's bulked. We know its volume is increased because it's wet. But what would that volume be when it's dry? Now, I could take that to a kiln. I could put it in an oven overnight. Um, we could dry all the moisture out until we know we've got a dry aggregate, and that would give us our dry volume. We don't need to do that. What we do is we flood it, we saturate it. By fully saturating this aggregate, what happens is it settles. And the fully saturated volume of sand is exactly the same as in its dry state. So by fully saturating that, it's still got some fines, there's some very small uh, particles in suspension. However, you can clearly see how much volume has decreased. So if we were using uh, a jar that actually had incremental volumes on it, we could measure the amount of water that was in it, how much it had bulked due to being damp. It's very simple science and I think it's magic. There is one other thing that we have to consider with all of our aggregates and this will depend on where it's sourced, where it's come from and that's salt content. We quite often see white salt deposits coming through new brickwork or block work and you'll notice it's always from the joints. And predominantly, not always, but predominantly, that is salts in the aggregate. They're not salts in the bricks or the concrete blocks or the stone. They are salts coming out of the aggregate. And that is because the aggregate has been sea dredged and has a high salt content. It doesn't look very nice. And with Portland cement, it probably doesn't cause that much damage but it's not good for lime. Those salts have a chemical reaction with the lime. They actually make it set slightly harder, but they are inefficient in the actually matrix of the lime mortars. We can't say we want our aggregates to be salt free, but we definitely want below 3% salt content for all lime mortars. Now I know that this finer, not very well graded, building sand has got high salt content in it. Um, you can measure that. You would literally saturate your aggregate, um, rinse it round, pour the water through a filter, um, maybe boil it, and you'll see the salts forming. You could just taste it, and you would taste salts in there. Not probably the best advice but we definitely don't want high salt content.